Hey everybody, welcome to Question and Answer Time. I'm your host, Adam Neely. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So, let's get started. Oh, and before we begin, I wanted to mention a couple things. The first thing is that this Q&A is going to be available as a podcast. Originally, I was doing these Q&As as podcasts, but then there were some hosting issues, but hopefully I've resolved them, so now you can go to the iTunes store and download it onto your device and listen to it as you would any other podcast, and be sure to leave a rating in the iTunes store because that definitely helps. So I hope you enjoy that. The other thing I wanted to mention is I'm now taking submissions for a new series I'm hoping to start called This Is Why You Suck, and basically I'm going to take user submissions of them playing their instruments, people playing their instruments, and I'm going to critique them. And this is inspired by a recent live stream where I critiqued somebody's performance on the bass guitar. So if you'd like to have your playing critiqued, send it to me in the YouTube comments section or at my Instagram, which is it's underscore Adam Neely. And yeah, Sandvich Block writes, can you introduce my question without playing the lick? Thanks. No. The Antichronist writes, Hi, etc. In the various styles I play slash write, depending on what instrument I'm on, there's a scale I like to use on piano, but I don't know what to call it. Could you help? D, E flat, F, G, A, B flat, C sharp, a D harmonic minor with a lowered second and a raised third. Thank you in advance. So I think you meant to say F sharp when you were spelling that scale because you mentioned a raised third and F sharp is a raised third to D harmonic minor. And if that was an F sharp, or if you were spelling that with an F sharp, it would produce a Byzantine scale, or also known as the double harmonic minor scale, which is a very interesting scale for a couple of reasons. The first reason is the augmented second interval in between E flat and that F sharp, as well as in between the B flat and the C sharp. And very few scales have two augmented second intervals. It's a very strange interval and it gives it that sort of Middle Eastern sort of flair that you might want to be going after. And a lot of people like that sort of sound of the augmented second. The reason why we call it an augmented second instead of a minor third is because those intervals, B flat to C sharp and also E flat to F sharp, span two letter names, E to F, two letter names, B to C, two letter names. And whenever you're naming intervals, it's always important to name the number, like second, third, fourth, fifth, based upon how many letter names are crossed. Now, the other interesting thing about the scale is the distance between C sharp and E flat, which is something that very rarely occurs. It's something called a diminished third, not a minor third, but a diminished third. And it comes up from this naming convention insisting that we have to name all the intervals based upon letter names. So C sharp, D, E flat. It traverses three letter names. So even though it goes only two semitones, C sharp to D and then D to E flat, well, we have to name it some kind of third. So we call it a diminished third. And it's a very weird instance where a diminished third is actually smaller than an augmented second. It makes very little sense, but when you, you do these weirder scales, you do end up in situations like that. Now, this diminished third makes it a little bit tricky to create harmony from this double harmonic minor scale or Byzantine scale, because normally when you create harmony, you create harmony by stacking thirds. So if you had the C major scale, you would stack thirds in order to create basic triads. So C, E, G is a major triad, and there are four kinds of basic triads. Major triads, minor triads, diminished triads, and augmented triads. But when you try and build a triad from the C sharp of a D double harmonic minor scale, you get a very strange triad that technically doesn't exist. C sharp, E flat, and G natural. And that might sound okay, but it definitely does not sound like one of the basic triads. And that makes life very difficult when you're trying to create harmony from this scale, the double harmonic minor scale, which is, I suppose, a little bit ironic. It's supposed to be doubly harmonic, right? I guess, I don't know. But you know, that's kind of what the deal is with this scale. And I think it's an interesting one, but there's some little like caveats that you should be aware of if you're trying to work with it. Albino Jack Russell writes, any theories as to why your audience is almost exclusively male? Perhaps Perhaps because of the old boys club that music tends to be that you mentioned in another video? Yeah, I mean, that definitely could be the case. I mean, music is a very male dominated space. And because I run a music YouTube channel, it's also going to be fairly male dominated. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that the music industry and the musical community in general is an old boys club, maybe less so than it was 50 years ago, but it still kind of is, which leads to all sorts of situations where female musicians will be actively discouraged from participating. This can be subtly or overtly. And this comes down from things like, you know, parents discouraging their daughters from picking up an instrument to all sorts of roadblocks along the way of a young female musician in terms of their learning and their career. 
uh, patronizing attitudes of people like uh, sound guys, for instance, who think that female musicians don't know how to set up their own equipment, which happens all the time. Uh, things like really shitty comments and YouTube comment sections, all sorts of little subtle um, subtle indignities that uh, female musicians have to deal with. And I was going to, I was going to say the term uh, microaggressions, but I know the term microaggression is kind of a triggering word for a lot of people there out on the internet, all the keyboard warriors who are going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe you said microaggression. Oh, you SJW cook. Next question. Blake Davis writes, what do you think of contemporary music reviewers like Anthony Fantano, the needle drop? You know, for the most part, I really dislike a lot of contemporary music reviews because I think reviewers viewers just don't have any sort of technical knowledge of the music that they're critiquing. It's kind of like if you're reading a restaurant review, right? You kind of want the food critic to have an understanding of the style of whatever that restaurant is. So I kind of want to have my food critic really understand the nuances of like Italian food, for example. You really want to know like what goes into a pasta pomodoro and like really have a deep understanding of like the history of all the dishes and like what a chef is really trying to do and the sorts of taste they're trying to like evoke with these dishes and all that stuff. You want that in a food critic. But for the most part, when I read a music review, it's kind of like the equivalent of just some guy raving about an Italian restaurant that he went to. It's like, oh, this Italian restaurant was so good. Like the sauce was so deep and so red. That's kind of the like surface level review, I feel like, of most music critics. It just, uh, it's, it leaves me so dry. Now, that said, I think Anthony Fantano is not that. And I think that's part of the reason why he's gotten so popular. That and the fact that he's really mastered the YouTube platform, but he does have at least a little bit more of a deeper understanding of the technical knowledge of a little bit of music theory, a little bit of music performance, a little bit of music production, music engineering. He at least has those things to draw from in his reviews, and those make them a little bit more engaging than uh, your generic pitchfork review. So yeah, uh, not too impressed with music reviewers. Super Mega Peanut writes, Hey Adam, someone I follow on Twitter recently said that Hey Ya has pretty much dropped out of the wedding band canon. Can you confirm slash deny this? And what's the general life cycle of hit songs for the Met players? <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely don't play Hey Ya anymore. It's kind of hard to say exactly what's going to be popular and what isn't. I mean, I thought that Can't Feel My Face would be really popular on the dance floor a couple years ago because it was all over the radio and that song by the weekend definitely did not get any people dancing for whatever reason, so we only played it for like a month, versus a song like, I don't know, 24 Karat Magic. I bet you we're going to be playing that for many years to come. So I'm not really complaining because I love that song, but uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of interesting. I don't really know the formula yet, but there we go. Famatory writes, There is no such thing as doing things wrong in music. Music is sounds in an order. No order is inherently any better than any other. Playing a saxophone with drumsticks is equally as valid as playing it with a mouthpiece. So I'm totally for free musical expression. And I think that playing saxophone with drumsticks would be hilarious. And I think you could do all sorts of fun things like playing different things on the bell versus on the pads because you could get different sounds and it'd just be visually kind of wacky. And it would be just a lot of fun. But I'm not for the anarchy of total musical relativism, which says that playing a saxophone with drumsticks is exactly the same as playing a saxophone with a mouthpiece. Because when you play a saxophone with a mouthpiece and do things a little bit more traditionally, what you're doing is you're borrowing from a history of human musical expression. Humans have been working on music for thousands of years and developing different ways of expressing themselves through that music. Whenever a musician comes along, they'll hear another musician play a certain way and they'll try and play a similar way and maybe add on to it and develop their own sort of expression through what that older musician did with the particular style at the time. When you play saxophone through a mouthpiece, what you can do is you can draw from the lineage of all the jazz musicians that came before you as a means of expressing yourself, or classical musicians that came before you, or rock musicians. When you play saxophone with drumsticks, you can't do that. You have to create your own musical language to express yourself. This is fine, but then you have to start thinking, can I express all the information that I want to and that I need to through this particular sort of paradigm, saxophone and drumsticks. And all of a sudden it becomes a lot less rich of a musical expression and becomes a little bit more of a narcissistic sort of approach to the whole thing. Music is a language and language is also a social construct which has taken many thousands of years of human history to develop. It's kind of like if you were to invent your own language. Yes, you technically could and you might be able to express some things within it, but it'd be a lot harder to communicate ideas to other human beings. Saying playing saxophone saxophone with drumsticks is equally as valid as playing saxophone with a mouthpiece is kind of similar to saying Dothraki is equally as valid as English. 
I mean, maybe at certain things, maybe, but for the vast majority of it, no, because English has a much deeper, richer history and a much bigger vocabulary in order to express much more intricate ideas. Xiao Lanli writes, What do you think about using eight string guitars and not having a bass player in the band? I mean, I don't particularly mind it. I'm a huge fan of animals as leaders and they have two eight string guitars and no bass guitar. But the fact of the matter is, is when you play those low notes on an eight string guitar, it just does not sound like a bass guitar. It's not processed the same way and it's not gonna have the same EQ. When you have a guitar player like Charlie Hunter who plays an eight string guitar, but with a separate pickup system running to a separate amplifier, then it is going to definitely sound like a bass guitar. But when you're talking about metal bands, it just doesn't. The bass guitar is going to have a different effect on the overall mix, which is why you have a band like Mashuga, who still has a bass guitar player and he's just doubling lines of the eight string guitars, but it sounds fuller and fatter because he's there adding a certain different sort of flavor to the sound. Number nine large writes, what's your opinion on bass tremolo bridges? Do you think that you would use one if you had a tremolo bridge? I think they're fun, um, but man, I would totally overuse one if I ever had one installed on one of my bases. It would just be really fun to do dive bombs and things like that, but just not tasteful or practical in any sort of way. I grew up listening to uh, Victor Wooten play one of those bases on like some Bela Fleck and the Flecktones record, and it was, it was like, oh my god, that's such a hilarious sound. And it also adds a visual element to your performance, which can be really fun, but at the same time, not the most, uh, not the most restrained sort of thing to do. So I don't think I'll ever be getting getting a tremolo bar, but uh, they would be fun. Fossil Fishy writes, I watched the video of you on Kelly and Ryan. I love how into it you are. If you're faking your enjoyment, I couldn't tell. Speaking of faking, I was wondering about the backing vocals that none of you are providing. Is the drummer triggering them or is the band playing to a backing track? It's that sort of thing that has always made me wonder about how much is live and how much is mimed. Care to share or are you under some sort of non-disclosure agreement? No, there was no miming going on. I am way Way too proud to have mimed a performance, especially on live television. Aaron was definitely not lip syncing. It was all real performance, just augmented by track, which is a fairly common thing. We were using an Ableton Live track that Josh the drummer was controlling. Part of the reason for the track that's important that may, a lot of people don't really understand, I guess, or I didn't really understand or even think about it until I started playing with this project is when you play it with the track, it's important for people to be able to Shazam a song so that you can find out what the artist is or who the artist is. And, you know, the manager was saying like, hey, we need to make sure that this sounds uh, as close to what the song Song actually is so people at home can go and shazam it if they're listening on their television. I thought that was interesting. Um, I certainly would never have thought of it, but that's part of the reason why the track was mixed so hot for the television broadcast. Dio Wardeman writes, Yo Adam, do you consider yourself more as a musician or a YouTuber slash content creator? I definitely think of myself as a musician first and foremost. I am way more qualified and way more experienced. So yeah, definitely a musician beyond everything else. I sort of fell into YouTubing and it's been fun for the past couple years, but I am always going to be a musician at heart. Wing Zero, a username spelled as if it was an 11 year old first getting internet access, writes, I disagree. I find pop music to be incredibly pretentious. Look at the pop and the image. I'm not saying that to sound elitist, the music is incredibly overproduced. What's not pretentious about that? The vocalists could neither write nor they can sing their own material, auto-tune anyone, but let's just pretend that none of that matters for a second. One does not get superstar status without branding. Branding. I'm trying to let that sink in for a second. You are being branded utter pretense. Thank you for proving my point because you just showed an incredible degree of contempt towards pop music and those who might write pop music and perform pop music and like pop music. You know, it's not really going against the grain to write a comment like this and say that you really hate pop music and that it's over commercialized and that it's all auto tune and nobody has any talent. I love playing pop music and it's partly because I understand the amount of craft that goes into it. I've gotten to see it firsthand. I'm not really quite sure what you mean by brand branding because I worry about branding all the time. It's kind of sunk in because uh, I worry a lot about my personal brand. All businesses have to worry about branding. And as a musician, you have to think of yourself as a business if you're going to be successful at all, as a self-contained entrepreneurial business. So I have to worry about my personal brand as a YouTuber, music creator, and a guy who plays bass on the internet and internet memes and all the things like All Star, that dumb song, for whatever reason, is part of my brand as a YouTube channel. <laughs> Little things like that I have to be aware of just in terms of how I create and work within the sphere of what it is I do as a creator. Brian Beller, a really awesome bass player, and he's played for Steve Vai and a couple other people, has this thing about where you should be able to identify your brand by 10 words or less because 
that's how people are going to understand what it is that you do. So if you think about awesome musicians, like, you know, Bootsy Collins has an awesome brand. Um, John Coltrane has a brand. Miles Davis certainly has a brand. Everybody in the public sphere and every business should have some sort of brand so that people can understand you and understand what you're able to give back to them. And if you're talking about that sort of branding, and if you have a problem with that, then you have a much bigger problem with the idea of capitalism, notoriety, and business in general. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that that's not what you're talking about. I think you're just talking about much more surface level understanding of what it is to be a musician and what it is to be a pop musician. So uh, yeah, thank you for your comment. Chris Burns writes, Ever have to play corporate gigs that were in a very tall building? I'm trying to get over a bad fear of heights in case something like that comes up, lol. I don't think this is a troll comment. It's way too subtle to be a troll comment, but if it was a troll comment, this is the most brilliant troll I have ever, ever seen. Uh, but to answer your question seriously, uh, no, I've never played in a very tall building, so don't worry about that. You will not have to turn down any gigs because of heights. But man, doesn't that sound like just the best troll? Oh God, anyway. Ed Harris 496 writes, Question for a QA. and a Is there a style of music that you particularly dislike playing? Contemporary Christian music. It's terrible. Somat Olivo writes, Adam, do you answer questions on YouTube? Yes. Johnny Nothing writes, Does harmonic and melodic minor modes have the same modal brightness concept as diatonic modes? Yes. Modal brightness definitely applies to the modes of the harmonic minor and also the melodic minor, as well as harmonic major and melodic diminished and harmonic diminished and all sorts of other crazy scales and then all of their modes. And they relate to one another in these really surprising ways. And at the end of my why is made your happy video, I did link to a bonus video where I talk about a lot of these concepts. And I'll link to it here also in the description and also in the cards and everything so that you can go and listen to me ramble about modal brightness and, and dihemitonic dihem heptatonic modality and all sorts of crazy theoretical concepts. If you're at all interested in negative harmony, definitely check out that video because I bet you, you will nerd out to it and it's going to be delicious, delicious, sweet jazz. So uh, yes. Check it out. Black Zeppelin 68 writes, Could you maybe explain how Purple Haze, which I believe is an E minor, has an E7 sharp nine chord? How exactly does it fit in the harmony? So that E7 sharp nine is a really interesting chord. It's kind of like a really spicy E major chord. The E7 sharp nine has a tonic function like E major does to the key of E. Now in my The Devil in Music video, I talk a little bit about dominant chords having tonic function in blues music. Even though dominant chords have a lot of tension inherent to them because there's a tritone in between the third degree and the flat seventh degree, they still, because of the nature of the blues and the aesthetic of the blues, they still can function as a tonic. It's the same thing here with this E7 sharp nine, even though it's even more spicy than a regular dominant seventh chord. I keep using the word spicy, but... <laughs> I guess it's better than saying a, a dank tonic. The E7 sharp nine is especially interesting because a sharp nine is kind of like the minor third. It's just another term for a minor third. It's kind of like having both the minor third and the major third in the same chord. Now, earlier on in the video, I said that an augmented second, like a sharp nine to the root, is not the same thing as a minor third, but you can kind of conceptualize it the same way because a lot of melodic patterns in the blues use a minor third instead of the major third, and that kind of rub between those two is a very interesting part that makes up a lot of uh, blues melodies. So you kind of have the blues in a chord when you have the E7 sharp nine starting Purple Haze, and it's a really, really awesome, powerful chord that has become associated with that particular song over the years. David W writes, 200,000 video? It's coming next week, I promise, and I promise you that you will hear 200,000 notes and it will be ridiculous, so don't worry. Real Raven 2000 writes, These were all memes, but weren't violin strings were made of cat's guts? So that's a little bit of a misconception. Cat gut strings do not actually come from cats, they come from sheep, because the word actually originally was kit gut, which I guess in German means sheep's intestines, which I guess is not that much better, but they weren't using cat's intestines, although I'm sure some mad scientist somewhere was dissecting cats and creating strings from their intestines. But yeah, most of them were actually dried sheep's intestine. BoobTuber06 writes, You know, there's nothing you've said that I didn't already know about, but I still can't stop watching you. How come you're not a professor? You're a natural. If anybody wants to hire me, 
Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching and listening. If you're listening to this on a podcast, this has been Question and Answer Time with Adam Neely. I hope you enjoyed it. Please comment, like, and subscribe, and also consider joining my Patreon because it's the patrons over at my Patreon that make this possible for me to create content week after week. So thank you so much. And until next time, peace.